Well, it's fun for me to greet a friend from many years, uh, Jim Sprague, who is the uh, CEO of the Pregnancy Resource Center in Grand Rapids. And outside in front of a beautiful lake. <laughs> Not in Grand Rapids today. <laughs> yeah, good morning to you, Jim. Good morning. So good morning, great. Randy. I'm joining you from, we are connecting uh, as I am up in Alpena, Michigan. Uh, my wife's family has a, a spot up here on, on Long Lake. And so we're working remotely today. That's, that's how it's done these days, right? Oh, yeah, somebody, somebody's got to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit more about Jim. Uh, he's a master of social work. Uh, he's a counselor sort of person, someone who cares about people. But he's, as I said, he's the chief executive officer of the Pregnancy Resource Center of Grand Rapids. And their mission, I love this, is to live the truth that people matter to God. That is an understatement. Uh, Jim's been leading this organization for more than 20 years. He and his wife, Jody have been part of the ministry since it was formed in 1985, which was also the year they were married. Yep, it was. You have three adult children, one grandchild. Mm -hmm. What is cool about uh, Jim and Jody is that each of their children were adopted from an unplanned pregnancy situation. Mm -hmm. To make Jim and Jody's heart and passion for pregnancy care ministry, both personal and sincere. And, and uh, I know Jim well enough to know that, that it is true. You're, you're, you, you, you speak and you work from the heart, Jim. So again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. So uh, you've, got, uh, you've got adult children that came from that situation. And you've shared with me uh, another time that... Uh, after getting married, you tried, uh, as many couples will, to say, hey, what, is, isn't it automatic? We're going to have some kids. Right. <laughs> but had other plans. Yeah, he did. He did. We were, we were in that infertility lane for nine years in our, wow. in our marriage. And um, yeah, and then God opened uh, our hearts uh, to the idea of adoption. And in 1994, uh, we adopted Jacob. And um, Randy, he was born to a 16-year-old girl. Wow. Uh, we're going to talk about the church a little bit today, I think. And uh, he was born to a young gal uh, who was uh, in the local church in West Michigan. And um, for her to tell the story, it was the first time she and uh, wasn't even really a boyfriend. She and a boy um, had ever uh, been intimate with anyone uh, and get this in the back seat of the car in the church parking lot after youth group. And she, she gets pregnant <laughs> and, you and uh, yeah. And nobody knew right up to the time that they took her to the hospital for what they, they thought was a, um, a burst appendix or something, an appendix uh, attack. Wow. And the doctors came out and said, Oh no, that's not what's going on. She's in labor. And that was, that was our, our first adoption. So an unplanned pregnancy. We're so grateful yeah. that Jacob's mom chose life. And how tempting under those circumstances in the church situation, 16 yeah. years old, unmarried, yeah. not even yep. her yep. boyfriend to just say, well, let's just sweep this one under the rug as it were through abortion. Yep. Right. Absolutely. That totally could have happened. And yeah, Jacob was uh, raised on prayers for Miss Sue, who gave life to him. So we thank the Lord for, for Sue every day. Yep. And, and then I, subsequently, I, Madison and Kevin, they were born to the same mom, same type of um, sure. uh, situation in terms of the fact that our culture, Randy, um, could have um, totally justified, and she could have justified, and our culture wouldn't have batted an eye if she had chosen to abort those two children who are our children. That's right. And uh, yeah, she was, she was in over her head, already yeah. had a house full of children and yeah. not a guy, not a guy around. Um, so yeah, so we understand the mission full well. Yeah, you do. You definitely mm -hmm. do. And your heart is definitely in it. So we stand here. It is June 30th, 2022. And just a few days after the, yeah. uh, U.S. Supreme Court did an incredible thing that, that you and I and many others have been praying for and longing yeah. for for almost 50 years. Yeah, yeah. Verse Roe v. Wade. 
Yeah, yeah. So you're a jubilee, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> right? The fifty, the fiftieth year when uh, yeah. the land gets reset. So we've had this uh, yeah. this law um, that uh, kind of created a constitutional right to abortion, and uh, we now have a court. Uh, yeah. who understood that that was manufactured, that uh, abortion rights will yeah. go back to the states now. That's right. You know, I've spoken on this issue a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as a juvenile court judge, you know, I had a case involving abortion, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll get into that, maybe we won't, but I, I ended up writing a book called Justice for the Unborn, which mm -hmm. caused me to travel the country and speak. And, and I would say, you know why we have abortion in America? Everyone knows mm -hmm. the Supreme Court gave it. They so said they found that in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which was passed in 1868, having nothing to do with abortion whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, let me let me quote the due process clause, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. That's the due process clause and the Supreme Court, the majority of the Supreme Court in 1973, ruled that what that means is that a woman has a right to abortion virtually throughout pregnancy. Pretty and creative. Were, I get this, <laughs> this look on people's faces when I say that. They say, why? Yeah. And I say, well, you see, you got to be a person to, to not be deprived of life. And the unborn, according to the Supreme Court in 1973, is not a person, at least not until it's viable outside the womb. Mm -hmm. But the woman mm -hmm. is a person. And mm -hmm. you can't take away her liberty rights uh, that include a right to uh, terminate the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so when Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, obviously he was referring to abortion. I mean, this is preposterous. <laughs> so yeah. the Supreme yeah. Court in this case, in this last month, just a week or so ago, they, they, they said, you know what? What the Supreme Court did in 1973 was preposterous. In fact, in my bo book, just let me close on this one and then turn it back to you. In my book on the subject, I quote pro-abortion legal scholars. Mm. And they all say, yeah, we love the decision of Roe v. Wade, but we shake our head in bewilderment, one of them said, mm -hmm. in how they came to the conclusion. It's just mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court is supposed to be a court and interpret mm -hmm. the law. They are not a legislature. Mm. And uh, they, they were way off base. So yeah. the fact that it was reversed was totally right. Yeah, thankfully that got corrected. Um, so what you have now is you have 50 Supreme Courts, though, right. that, are wrestling, that are wrestling with uh, this yeah. right to choose an abortion in their states. Yeah. Yep. So you want to talk about Michigan for a minute? Yeah, let's do that. I mean, where, where okay. do we stand in Michigan, uh, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a law that comes out of, uh, boy, I think it's 1846, Randy, that was tested in 1931. So commonly mm -hmm. people here uh, refer to as the law of 1931. Right. But I think most accurately, uh -huh. you would know better than I, I feel like, you know, I'm talking to the judge here, but uh, uh, you would probably know better than I that that law tested in 1931. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, in 1973, um, actually outlaws abortion in the state of Michigan. Right, right. And uh, it was a trigger law that was on our books. So when Roe uh, was repealed or when it would have been repealed yep. um, as, as, as was ruled in 1931 in 73, actually after Roe v. Wade, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like uh, the Supreme Court of Michigan said, um, yeah, that's going to be a temporary, maybe they saw it was ridiculous as well, Randy, I don't know, sure, sure. Uh, but they saw five months after the Roe decision was handed down mm -hmm. from the U.S. Supreme Court, okay. the Michigan Supreme Court still upheld a law that they knew wouldn't go in effect until Roe was repealed. So now we're in that era. We are a post-Roe nation. Yeah. Uh, and thank God for that. But there are, as I say, 50 Supreme Court battles. So Michigan has this trigger law outlawing abortion right. except that that's not the case because um, michigan's governor governor whitmer has filed a suit with the michigan supreme court claiming this law mm -hmm. is unconstitutional right. and there was a judge who slapped an injunction on that law so that last friday mm -hmm. uh the 24th of june when roe uh, was removed. The effect of Roe was removed because of the court's decision on Dobbs. Right. 
um, that law did not go into effect. So on Monday morning, um, abortion clinics in Michigan could be open for business. Now, um, remind me of the Kent County prosecutor's name, Chris Becker. Becker, yes. Yeah, is that correct? Yes. So uh, it was um, it was noted in uh, the news that Chris Becker announced that in Kent County, he was going to prosecute anyone performing abortions wow. according to the 1931 law. Okay. So this is hot off the press, Randy. So here we sit on a Thursday. Yesterday, the abortion clinic at 320 Fulton, which serves Kent County and all of West and Northern Michigan, because it is the only surgical abortion provider in the area, they were notified um, by uh, the prosecutor's office that they would be prosecuted from this day forward if they perform abortions. So I have it on good authority, someone who was an eyewitness there, now I get it, I'm getting it second hand, but this is a, a reputable source yep. who was on site uh, yesterday, Wednesday, mm -hmm and said that at eight o'clock there were women lined up at the door who couldn't get in and they were sent home. And by 10 o'clock, the uh, abortion doctor and all of his staff walked out as well. Wow. So in Kent County, um, there's no abortion happening at 320 Fulton. I can only assume, I know, <laughs> I can only assume that at the Planned Parenthood facility where they do, this, uh, they do the chemical abortion, uh, that they got the same word from um, uh, yes. Prosecutor Beckett. Becker. Um, Becker. Uh, Becker. Yeah. I'm sorry, Becker. Yeah. And uh, I can only assume that they got the same word and that uh, they are not doing the chemical. Oh, praise God. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you, God. That is Isn't that amazing? Word. Yeah. But again, yeah. The, uh, the whole country is not particularly at peace at this point. Uh, oh, my you know, Those who are in favor of abortion are rising up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's just kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, it, it's like it's only a woman's right. My body, my choice. Yeah, if we're just talking about one body, it mm. would be that way. But we're talking yeah. another body that could be male inside the female here and certainly with yeah. their DNA and, and everything else. I mean, we're talking about a unique Absolutely. creation, somebody that God has created. I mean, I've got yeah. Psalm 139 here. I love Psalm 139, verse 13. Read it. David said you created my inmost being you god knit me together in my mother's womb and apparently the hebrew there is emphatic saying you alone i mean we are yeah. creations of god we're creating the image of god and and for us mm -hmm. to just cavalierly say no nah, just throw it away let's we don't need this particular yeah. child i mean it's just so yeah. sad but again yeah. if, if you're not somebody that believes in the bible you know if, if everything just kind of evolves and everything's just yeah. biological you know you well might... the science is with us too though randy i mean uh, obviously the the text has always been with us god is the yeah. author and sustainer of life yeah um but science is with us now too and and the pro-choice advocates um by and large are no longer chanting uh, it's just a blob of cells yeah that's true. um that's true. you know with ultrasound and dna yep. testing and everything there's pretty much an understanding yeah. that that is a separate human being yeah and you know randy uh you and i are old enough to remember the days when you got in an airplane and as soon as the wheels were up everybody lit up a cigarette and the and the fus fuselage became a cloud uh and if you were lucky enough to be behind the curtain you know that was yeah, that was yeah, the non-smoking yeah. smoking area as if yeah. it didn't affect you well we laugh about that because it's ridiculous to think yeah. anymore that my right to smoke in a public place trumps your right to breathe fresh air in a in a public place mm, that's good. but when it comes to a baby in the womb um her her rights as as the mother um somehow don't don't stop at at the at the womb yeah. and that we protect the rights of a separate individual who may be uh who who needs to be given life and uh, ought to be protected we don't see them as a, a separate individual and uh, you know my rights stop at, at your body, yeah. but we don't we don't hold the same. So even the science, um, yeah. and uh, I, that's where I think things are just getting louder. Yeah. Right. If if you can't just say any longer that it's a blob of cells, I guess we just have to be louder and in some cases even more violent. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's just our message. It's just they just make it emotional and so on. I yeah. I, I debated when I was traveling the country on a book that I wrote dealing with abortion called Justice for the Unborn. I uh, was at uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, debating a feminist attorney on the subject of abortion. And again, her whole argument was it's women, female, women, it's women, 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 women. And I said, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right time out. And again, the, the crowd was very much on her side of things for the most part, but, but then they I caused them to, to stop in it for at least a moment by saying this. They said, okay, if it's all about women, let, let's just say for sake of argument that it's all about females. Okay, could you at least not abort the unborn female babies? And they just kind of, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was yeah. actually repeated in the, the school newspaper <laughs> okay. that line i mean yeah. it, yeah, i mean if it please people we're talking about little boys and little girls mm -hmm. that god is mm -hmm. creating mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, what, what is it it's a it's a human being it is and it's just so yeah is it expensive yes <laughs> does it take time and effort yes is there pain involved in the pro ask my wife we have, we have of course. children hello and she hates pain but mm -hmm. she loves children more than she hates the pain and we're so mm -hmm. thankful for each one mm -hmm. uh, and now mm -hmm. 35 grandkids and one great oh grandkid, my goodness believe it yeah, or not, which is yeah kind your of quiver is full <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah. here we are in a post row america so what, what, what should what should the church's attitude be at this point jim what do you think? Mm -hmm. How should we be responding as followers of Christ to the yeah. fact that we're in a post role America? Yeah, I've, I've, I've received phone calls and we have at the PRC and, and some emails and texts from uh, pastors who are asking that very question. What do we do? Yeah. Um, you know, at PRC, we're going to keep doing uh, what we've done, Randy. And I think we're going to have to do more of it. So I, I, I often talk about PRC, you think about Pregnancy Resource Center, but it's also a good way mm -hmm. to think about what we do and what the church can be doing. The P is be proactive. The R is be responsive. And the C is be compassionate. I love it. So our, our ministry has a proactive arm. It's the education arm. And we're in schools and churches, but we want churches to also think about how can we be proactive? Mm. Randy, 40 to 60% of women who had abortions are coming from the church. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible to me. So my answer to pastors is saying, well, what can we do? They're thinking, obviously, like, how can we come help you yeah. at PRC? Yeah. But I want to say, open your doors yeah. for us to come help you to yeah. equip mom and dad to have ongoing conversations about sex and relationships mm -hmm. God's way. Yeah. What's the first commandment, Randy, that God gave Adam and Eve? Cool. Be fruitful and multiply. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, right? So he gave them the gift of sex for yeah. procreation. Right. And I, I sometimes think, Randy, that he threw in um, the pleasure of the sex act as, as a bonus. A bonus, part. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now look at what our world has done. Yeah. The world has flipped it and they want to emphasize the pleasure aspect right. of it. That's right. They want nothing to do with the procreation aspect right. of it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's really the foundation of, of things yeah. like Planned Parenthood, et cetera, et cetera, and abortion industry is we want all the pleasurable, pleasurable aspect of that gift, yeah. but we don't want to be responsible for the outcome, the right. pregnancy, right. the God-given reason for, for the procreation is that he loves people. So we want to be proactive in this message in churches and in families and help um, Christian families certainly raise their their um, their children yeah. in God's plan for sex and relationship. Then we need to be responsive. OK, we need to be able to say to our kids, um, we don't want you in that situation. You know, sex is a gift and uh, best enjoyed in, in the context of a committed relationship. Right. But if you find yourself in an unplanned pregnancy, yeah. Uh, abortion is not the answer. That's we right. will come around you. We will support you. And that's what we do at the PRC with our pregnancy testing, our ultrasound, mm -hmm. or the coaching and the counseling that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. And we want to help churches be established in that way, too, to say, not necessarily bring a pregnancy center into the church, but who are the first responders? First responders. 
right? Why is it, Randy, that uh, a young girl or a family even in that situation where that 15, 16 year old girl is pregnant, they go to the arms of the abortionist before they go to the arms of the church. We have to shift that mindset to say, yeah, we don't want you in that situation, but you know what? No judgment. <laughs> we're we're going to come alongside you because that life is a gift. Yes. And even though you weren't planning on it, guess who was? <laughs> That's right. the, the author of that life and the one uh, whose image that life bears planned on that. So let's be responsive. Let's come around and then see, most importantly, and what we do at PRC and what we need churches to do is to be compassionate right again i said no judgment we're going to walk with you we're going to help you with this life and also because 40 to 60 percent of abortion happens in church families guess what they're with us on sunday they're in our pews they're in our congregations they're the walking wounded among us and are we opening the doors of conversation and the doors of, of healing and bringing the forgiveness of christ you know i've talked with women who feel like that decision I made to have an abortion, God just, he thinks differently about me now. Um, he's, you know, I just haven't been able to receive the forgiveness that I have for, you know, some other sins that I've confessed to the Lord, but he's, he's still mad at me about this. And I just want to help women and men understand that is not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And there is no sin that he will not forgive and forget yeah. and heal us from. So how do we be proactive, responsive, and compassionate? That's what we got to do next. And we have to do it first and foremost in the context of the church. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. You know, I, it, we can outlaw abortion um, and I'm, it needs to be, but to really change the hearts of people, especially, you mm. know, starting with us in the church about yeah. the, the place of what, what, is, what is God's purpose for, for the sexual relationship. It's supposed to be between a man and a woman in marriage only. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's certainly it's one of his primary goals, I think, is to, 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 to have that incredible sense of oneness and unity between husband and wife. But as you point out, secondarily, it's the potential of, uh, of children being created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, and again, yeah. you know, our story, we, we were done at four. <laughs> I mean, we have four yeah. lovely, incredible daughters, and I'm sure we couldn't afford any more. I yeah, you had, you had a white pick, white pick and fence, and a golden yeah. retriever, and you, we, we, you were all set. We had a golden retriever, <laughs> but we, I knew we couldn't fit them in our car or our house. I couldn't afford any more. They were a lot of yeah. work, and I wanted an airplane. That was my hidden desire. Yeah. I used to fly private airplanes. And then Barsha prayed this scary prayer. God, that's enough kids. But if you want us to have more, change Randy, me. Oh. And God began to mess with me in a huge way. And finally, I said, all right. But now looking back on it, you know, why do people have abortions, Jim? They don't want to be found out. It's, it's, it'd be inconvenient. It's embarrassing. They, they got a career. They, it's not because they want to kill an unborn baby. That mm -hmm. is the indirect result. But guess yeah. who had similar attitudes? I don't want any more kids. It's inconvenient. And, I, it's and hard. we made specific decisions in our, real, our intimacy to, mm. to prevent a child from being born or conceived. So I'm saying I had the same attitude as a pro-abortion person, mm. the same result, no child born, just mm -hmm. a different means. Mm. And I don't think God's impressed. I've confessed mm. I've been pro-life, quote unquote, since forever, but I really think I've had a pro-abortion attitude. Mm. And I don't think I'm alone in this. I think, you know, many, most Christians, you know, do this. We think sex is great, right. children not right. so great. We're going to right. take specific steps to prevent one from causing the other. We yeah. don't even think about it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm telling yeah. you, that, and again, so I think there's a, I think we as Christians have not been the salt and the light to our culture. Mm -hmm. I think because we've been ambivalent about our own attitude toward the value of children versus the mm -hmm. value of sex. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have, we've not, we've, 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 I used to say this in juvenile court, what parents excuse in moderation, children will take one step further. Mm. So the parent that shoplifts and I've had parents come into court and I shop should not be surprised their commit their kids 
commit breaking and entrance. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the parent that, that uses prescription drugs to get high or to feel better should not be overly surprised when their kid gets into mm -hmm. hard core drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing that we Christians are to be in the salt and light of our culture. When we, when we are not the way we should be 100% godly, like in this area, we shouldn't be totally surprised that our culture says, oh, okay, well, yeah. let's just take it one step further. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, um, the abortion industry certainly uh, is no stranger to having Christians um, involved in it. Our, you know, the, the story that we tell at... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, our own abortion clinic here in Grand Rapids is that there's the doctor there who um, shows up for, you know, work every morning and there are sidewalk counselors and some of them have been there, Randy, 30 plus years yeah. and know him uh, by name. And you get about 17 seconds to have a short conversation between the, between the car and the building. And uh, Mary, one of those sidewalk counselors told the story about asking him because she's, she's concerned about his eternal Sure. Uh, soul, Absolutely. you know, sure. and and wants to. No, we don't wants hate to, him. We love you know. He's, he's, he's the he's the POW man. Right. You know, right. he and and our heart is to rescue POWs, and so in that context, she's like, "Would you ever consider coming to church?" And he, as she told the story, t uh, stopped and turned around and looked at Mary and said, "Mary, I I'd consider coming to church with you when your church is no longer coming to me." Yeah. And, you know, when that story reached us, along with the statistic about 40% on the low end of women surveyed, 40% are coming from Protestant evangelical churches, and they're in church two or more Sundays last week. Randy, that's me. Yeah. That's my family. That's right. Um, and and uh, it's so many who, who might be listening to, to this conversation. Yeah. And uh, we have to understand that to an abortion doctor in the city of churches, we've lost our witness. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because he sees the Calvin, Hope, Cornerstone, Aquinas, you know, announcing sweatshirts and the yeah. Igthus bumper stickers. And, and he understands these are pastor's kids and churchgoers' yeah. kids. That's right. And you're coming to me and paying me to keep your secret. And if we can get past that, I might consider, you know, what this church thing yeah. is all about and if i can just do the math for a minute you talk about defunding the abortion industry get your mind around this if 40 percent on the low end of a million abortions a year in our nation mm -hmm. right is four hundred thousand babies sure that's that's a big chunk of babies right of that's that number that are coming from yeah. these are our babies that's these right. are our children that's and right. god is grieved he yes. is the god of abraham isaac and jacob i will be faithful yeah. from generation to generation yeah. and so here we are aborting 400,000 yeah. um, potential worshipers Randy I know. and let's just do the math on the defunding the abortion industry piece if there's 400,000 abortions directly from the church the average cost of an abortion is about 500 bucks right and you want to get your calculator out so you can keep track of the zeros because there's a bunch of them but if you multiply 400,000 times 500 it's 200 million dollars yeah. almost a billion with a b goes into the abortion industry every year directly from the church mm. and so this is why the prc exists to serve the bride of christ yeah, well, that's so <laughs> because good. that's that's where the power is but it's also where the problem is and it's also where we need to bring the p the r the c we got to be proactive yes. in our congregations we have to be responsive when when bad things happen you know like out of god's plan thing things uh, type things happen and we have to be compassionate above all we have to walk with these women and these families so that they're not driven to the abortion industry, but they are driven to the arms of Christ in the local church. We have to love them where they're at. Well, I love what you're doing, man. You got to keep it up. And let, let me just go on again a little bit on the, the, the positive side of, of children. Again, my own experience and that of a number of other people that we have influenced that have just, I mean, there's this one family, you know, the Bontrager family. In fact, I interviewed them uh, a few months back. They were going to have two kids. They're from Iowa. We have never physically met them. We talked to them on the phone and I did a podcast with them, but uh, recently, but uh, they, uh, they, they heard us talk with Jim Dobson about this, the 
this whole story of the, how God influenced us so that we were open to having more children, which we obviously had. We now have 12 mm-hmm. and we are thankful for that. Yeah. They heard that story and they changed their mind. This is back mm-hmm. in 1994, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. They now have 10 children and mm-hmm. they travel the country. They're the Bontrager family singers. And every one of the members of the family out of the blue wrote, wrote us a number of Christmases ago, maybe four or five years ago thanking us for talking with Jim Dobson on the subject. Wow. And uh, the, the younger one said, if, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here, you know? It's, right, right. <laughs> there's truth to that, but but the point I wanna make is, and I again, I, I'm just so grateful for God's grace to, to me and, and to Marcia as well, but children are messages that we send mm. to a time and a place that we mm. ourselves can never go. Mm. They're missionaries to the future. And wow. I just want, I want those listening to, to, to pray about letting Jesus, he's supposed to be Lord of every area of our life, but this one area of our family size is an area that we kind of say, well, we manage this based on what we think we can afford, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Shouldn't Jesus be Lord of that area? Mm-hmm. And what, what does that mean? If you're healthy, if you're, again, if there's illnesses and so on, you make these decisions in light of, of those cir- circumstances. But if you are healthy and are married, should you not say, Lord, if you want to create a child through our uh, intimacy, you mm-hmm. go right ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. And because uh, God wants more people in this world that are going to influence and, and touch yeah. lives for eternity. Yeah. So exactly. I just want to end with that from my point of view. Anything else you want to end with? Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to close us in prayer, my brother. Well, um, a couple of thoughts come to mind, Randy. Sure. One is I've been doing this work for a while, as you mentioned in the intro. It's been over 21 years, actually. And I've run into um, occasion where people say, uh, you know, you're having a conversation about the life issue. And they say, well, you're just biased, maybe because you're religious or, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but I just want to share this um, about our heart for women in an unplanned pregnancy situation and what my bias really is. I will, I will confess. Yes, I am biased. I am biased to the fact that I just don't believe Randy, that the woman who woke up on the morning of her abortion appointment, if she slept much at all that night, I I don't believe she woke up in the morning and said, Oh man, today's going to be a great day. I can't wait to get down there and have my abortion. Mm. Mm-hmm. My bias is she she's acting more like an animal, like Teresa Burke, who wrote about her work with post the board of women mm-hmm. said they don't choose abortion like they choose a flavor of ice cream or a new car or where they're going to live. They choose abortion more like an animal yeah. who stepped in a trap yeah. and chooses to gnaw off its own foot to get free. Wow. They choose a they choose a limp. Yes. Um, to go through life rather uh, than than uh, continue to stay in what feels like a trap. Yeah. So our bias in this work has to be that um, we are going to step in and we're going to we're going to do what we can to spring your foot from that trap. Yeah, yeah it's going to leave a mark. Yep. Right. Yep. But uh, we're going to we're going to walk with you. And um the story I would close with is just one, you talk about our personal journey and having children um, who another woman chose to give birth to, even in the context of a situation in our culture, they never would have again batted an eye at any of these moms if they had gone to the abortion clinic instead, but they gave life to these children and they made an adoption plan. And Randy, our oldest son, sat us down uh, right at the at the start of COVID, okay? In February of 2020, he sat us down on a Wednesday night and he said, I got some news. Do you know that new girlfriend of mine? <laughs> and I said, no, actually I've not met her. Remind me of her, of her name again. He said, well, she's pregnant. Wow. And um, so this is a kid who was involved at PRC, went through our, our training on uh, sexual purity, obviously not embracing that now. Mm. And he gives us that news because he said, Dad, I'm not quite sure what she might do. 
can we come to the PRC tomorrow? She needs to have an ultrasound. And so on Thursday morning, I meet the, the mother of, 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 would be the mother of my, my granddaughter at the PRC and they go back and she comes out after an ultrasound, 100% on life. And in September of, uh, of 21, she gives birth to our little granddaughter. And I'm just saying, um, I understand the embarrassment. I understand the struggle. I understand even the temptation to say, oh, I got to protect the reputation. We need to make this go away. Look at what I do, Randy. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and I think it was just an opportunity to do exactly what we preach, oh, to be compassionate, to lean in, to be responsive and say, yep, you bet, Jake. We will certainly meet you uh, at the PRC and we'll have an ultrasound and we're going to help you every step of the way. So, uh, again, I think we as believers have to lean into these situations and uh, that's how we get to show the love of Christ. And our granddaughter, I pray, becomes a follower and a worshiper and a game changer, you know, for the kingdom in the future. Um but she never would have had that chance if she she wasn't born. You know, she was unplanned to us, but she was she was conceived first in the mind yeah. of of God who who knew her and loved her. So so anybody you know, that's that's listening um, that you know has uh, someone that needs to talk to PRC, you got people that are standing there ready to talk and help and encourage. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, prcgr.org. Uh, and uh, just uh, just check in with the team, and and uh, we'll we'll come alongside whatever the situation, without mm-hmm. judgment, bringing the love of Christ uh, to, I to I that I love what you do. I love your heart. God bless you, thank my you. brother. Why don't you close thank us you. in prayer? Would you do that? Jim? I'd love to do that. Father, thank you for this day, the gift of uh, the the gift of the day, the gift of of life. Uh, we have breath in our lungs, mm-hmm. and we have a heartbeat, and we have a purpose that you have. Uh, given us with this day. And today it included talking with Randy and doing this conversation. And Lord, I pray that you would use it, uh, Father, that you would use it to expand your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for Randy. Thank you for uh, Marcy and their story. Uh, Thank you for the story that you're writing in each of us to reflect your goodness and your character. Father, I pray that you would find us faithful to do the good work that you've prepared in advance for us to do. Help us to build your kingdom here again on earth yes. as it is in heaven. That is our heart's desire. Use these jars of clay mm. so that the uh, glory would be of the all-surpassing glory of Christ and not of us. We pray these things in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Jim. God richly bless you, brother. My pleasure, Andy. Thank you.